Nancy Smith Maddox on Shine Your Light Radio Ministry on WYTV7 in Charlotte. I'm in Little Rock, Arkansas. My guest tonight is from Hot Springs, Arkansas, so I'm really excited. We're still in this series of building up to the Day of Empathy, which is March 25th, 2020. I'm so excited to have such a special, beautiful guest tonight with a beautiful spirit. So I think you're going to learn a lot and get a lot out of um, out of her. And without further ado, let me introduce her. Uh, her name is Nicole Smart, and that's because she's smart. So I'm real excited about that. Uh, but let me tell you a little bit too about uh, Sh- um, WYTV7. We are a nonprofit. We do take donations and seed money. We use our donations to um, to promote the shows that each broadcaster does. At any given time, we can have several million viewers. But in this case, we're talking specifically about the Little Rock Day of Empathy that's going to be on the Capitol steps on March 25th. And, uh, of course, it is, an, it is a National Day of Empathy, so they'll be celebrating it all over the country and all over the United States. So, uh, Miss Nicole, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, well, my name is Nicole Smart. Um, I'm the uh, treatment coordinator for the Arkansas Department of Corrections. Um, I supervise uh, a range tree program that I um, assisted in developing in 2015 when the governor said we're going to do some reform and rehabilitation for offenders. Um, I also supervise the juvenile programming um, inside the Department of Corrections and volunteer services. Wow, that's that's a awesome. That's a huge responsibility that you have, and uh, you also um, tell us a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your uh, past and and where you've been and where you want to go, Nicole. Okay. Well, I'm originally from around St. Louis, Missouri, and when I was younger, I moved to when I was 18, I moved to Hot Springs, Arkansas. And started um, a career in corrections about five years later, but I was actually in security. And when um, rehabilitation kind of started to to gain um, a little bit more power, and the governor said we need to do some reform, I was actually the disciplinary sergeant. So I was actually um, holding security security inside of a male um, prison. And so I just kind of ran with it and went and found a bunch of mentors and community um, uh, people, volunteers, stakeholders. And learned everything I could learn from them and just research what reentry really meant and uh, how we should practice it and what protocols should be. And we implemented it at one prison um, in Malvern, Arkansas, Washita River Unit, and it was very successful. So from that point, um, I was um, I had the opportunity to promote and become the treatment coordinator for the entire state. So what we did was we replicated that one program at 13 other units um, for females and males. And since then, um, we, I still supervise and we still are evolving in both men and women's prisons, but I've taken a lot of trauma um, courses for women. And so now we're kind of altering um, the women's uh, curriculum around trauma and, and you know, uh, focusing on not re-triggering trauma. So hope to go. Um, I'm in college full time right now. And I, th- I hope eventually that uh, maybe I can promote my way up to maybe like a deputy director. At some oh, my place. word. That'd be awesome. Well, uh, for the uh, benefit of our audiences, I talk a lot about reentry. I have a pu- uh, publishing program for re- reentry uh, uh, prisoners and formerly incarcerated where we publish their books and we give them a really good price. And uh, we just let them publish their story because their story with when when they're within the walls is so uh, poignant and so it's a it's a form of therapy for them to write their story so but tell our audience a little bit more about what reentry is and maybe some of the um, the uh, difficulties that they have re- the returning uh, citizens okay so uh, the reentry program is six months long um, it's completely voluntary uh, we don't have the pro board or anyone stipulate this program because if, if they don't want to be there and they're not ready yet, we're not going to put them in a situation where they have to do it. Um, it's uh, all of uh, the units have their own barracks. So we're housing like-minded people that are about to go home anywhere from six to 18 months. From there, we start kind of like an orientation. And uh, one of the one of the key components, I guess, that was so important was you can't take the person out of the prison, but you can take the institution out of the person. So we, um, you know, painted walls and we put motivational, uh, you know, uh, speeches on the walls, things like that. And then we start with cognitive behavior therapies, um, kind of changing the mindset. 
and it's not a one one size fits all program. So we have so many components, relapse prevention, family reunification, things like this. So for six months, they're getting programming, but while they're getting the programming, we bring in volunteers from the outside, um, resource providers, um, state employees that provide benefits, and then we work uh, towards family reunification. We have trade fairs where all of our volunteers will come in and set up and they can visit each booth. And then we have a play area for them and their children. They can read to their children um, like fish like they were at a carnival. Um, we try and do some really great incentive things that some the things would help them once they're released. Uh, one of the biggest um, conflicts and barriers that a person has with a challenge background is um, they need a mentor that's going to stick by them. Um, they need to be, become gainfully employed. So we want to give them the tools and the resources needed to become gainfully employed. But um, bridging that gap between the community and people coming out of incarceration uh, really is provide knowledge. And that's why I think the Dave Empathy is so great because um, you, you have Lock Up Raw and all those crazy television shows and people on the outside that don't know what it's like on the inside. They get really nervous about people that may have a challenge background or has a felony, but um, they're just like us. Um, that's one of the things that uh, they need to know. Um, not everybody comes to prison as, as a murderer and, and a, a serial killer. There are good people in prison that just got wrapped up in drugs or, or things like that, but they don't need a hand out. They need a hand up. Absolutely. And, you know, with, with what's going on right now with criminal justice reform and cut 50 and all of that, it's like more, more um, are receiving clemency and more receiving pardons, which is absolutely fantastic. They just had a, another couple that were released today. So it's really, really exciting. But there is a need uh, to teach them how to be in society and there's also a need to teach us how to accept them being back in society because everyone everyone i know people get are fearful of them and uh, it's so sad because you know they they've uh, paid their dues and they're, they're ready to get out now so but uh, i think that's a fantastic program i absolutely uh, love that so um so tell me a little bit about think think legacy that's a program that you started right yeah, I assisted in developing it in 2015. Um, it's a, basically, it's a cognitive behavior <clears throat> um, therapy program, but there's all, kind of fast, all kinds of facets such as um, anger management, um, healthy boundaries, uh, family reunification, healthy relationships, relapse prevention, um, drug intervention, substance abuse education. It's all up to date and it's all... Um, it's not a program where you get a packet and you fill it out and you turn it back in. Every, every component is we engage um, these individuals. We treat them like humans. We don't call them. Um, we stay away from trigger words like inmate, things like that. It's Mrs. Mr. I'm in a dignified experience. Uh, when they leave that program, we want them to feel human again. We don't, we do not want them to feel like uh, an inmate or, you know, a stereotype. And it's basically putting humanity at back, you know, the pendulum would swing from punishment to rehabilitation. We want to be on the rehabilitation side. When they leave prison, we want them with their head up and they know that they're going to have challenges, but we want them to know that if you have to call us at seven o'clock at night because you're having an issue, we say call before you fall. Yes. Um, a lot of people, they've never had anybody. They have no hope. It's hope, despair, hope, despair. And so we want to we want to give them the hope that they need to, to motivate them to go out and do the right things and become you know a a law abiding a citizen with a, a, sustain their lives. Several of them that I'm that I'm associated with that I that we're doing their books. Uh, one was incarcerated 25 years. One was incarcerated 28 years. The other one is still incarcerated on life sentence. I'm just praying that he'll get clemency or get a pardon because of of uh, he's over in in a prison here in Arkansas. But uh, one uh, lady was in 46 years. And I mean, it's just such an adjustment when they're in such a controlled environment and all of a sudden they don't know how to be free. They, 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 they're they as fearful or more fearful going out into the society than we are society that are willing to accept them. So you're absolutely right. They just need a, they need a friend. They need someone that'll listen to them. They need someone that they'll be an accountability partner really, because you don't want them going back to their own ways. Yeah. And, uh, that, that's one of our main components in Think Legacy is we have staff um, that, are, that are employed by the ADC, but the majority of our facilitators and um, our, our mentors are volunteers. We have over 250 volunteers. Wow. And we spread them across the state because they need that interaction with someone that doesn't work in the prison. 
Yeah. Oh my goodness. Wow. The other big part is um, prior offenders that have been incarcerated. Those are some of our our key um, our key players in this too. Our secretary actually changed the policy where if you've been incarcerated before, you can come back in as a mentor and tell what your barriers are, what your challenges were, and how they overcame them. Yeah, that's awesome. That is just that's a that's a fantastic program. So why is it important uh, for you, Nicole, to be involved with the Day of Empathy? First of all, tell us what your version of the Day of Empathy is. I'm trying to emphasize that all the way throughout all of these uh, interviews leading up to the Day of Empathy, which is March 25th. So tell us about 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 uh, you and what you, what how you're involved with it. Okay. So I um, also work with Ruby Welch. She's one of our volunteers, and I, I didn't have a lot of knowledge on the Day of Empathy until last year. But I think it's important for me to be involved in the Day of Empathy because um, even though we work with incarcerated people, they're, uh, they, they deserve forgiveness. They deserve a second chance. And not living in prison before, listening to other people's stories and, and how they overcame, it kind of gives me another perception of, you know, everybody has a story and the way we address them might trigger, you know, different feelings. But more uh, than anything is um, I've come across so many people that just feel hopeless, you know. So the more knowledge that I gain from the Day of Empathy, the better off the people that I'm, I'm helping or assisting will be because I have that knowledge. Um, and I believe just in a humane experience. Um, wow, that's and, great. What does empathy look like uh, from your point of view in the community? Bridging that gap from incarceration to release um, and, and just allowing people that their time has been served. We, they shouldn't be punished anymore. Let's give them a chance. Let's get them gainfully employed. I think uh, the, that's the biggest um, component for me is to go out and provide that knowledge that these are not uh, bad people. They just made a bad choice. And we need to accept them, engage them. Yes, ma'am, right. But you know what, though? Also, uh, their family and their support on the outside is not always there for them either. No. So, I mean, how, how do they even, I mean, when they walk out on the street to freedom, how do they even find a place to live? How do they find a job? And uh, There's all kind of challenges to them. And a lot of it is uh, mental health issues. I mean, they have to have their mind right. So I could just think of a million things that would happen, but several of them that I'm associated with, they say they don't have their family support, which is, is probably absolutely horrible. Yes. Yeah, we try while they're incarcerated, um, part of the community um, engagement that we have and the, the, you know, the empathy is, going out there, you know, when they're, when they're incarcerated, we try and be the legs to go get all those resources for them and actually hand them a packet, who to call, um, if they need food, you know, to, uh, they can fill out different applications that we can turn in, you know, about 90 days before they're released, housing, we try to keep an updated list of that, jobs, um, we call them selling friendly employers, we try to keep all of these, um, all these resources at their fingertips so they can get them anytime. So if they know they're going home, they can just go to our resource wall and gather that information. And we are so big on planning, planning A, B, C, and D plans. And so we have them write it out because if A doesn't work, then you have B, C, and D. So that's, I think that's um, my big thing with the community and empathy is getting out there in the community and gathering those resources and bringing them back in. Absolutely, and it's a it's a beautiful uh, thing that you do. Um, um, I I'm just so excited to have you on uh, Shine Your Light Radio Ministry on WYTV Seven. We're going to take a quick commercial break, and then we'll be right back. Okay. Okay. Stop using chemicals and start healing with silver. Pick up Third Rock Essentials Silver Infusion Blue Bottle, our concentrated Excelsior Serum, or any of our silver-based personal care products. For your gut, your gums, a UTI, a cut, a bite, or even bad breath. Until Big Pharma took things over and began telling us little people that all we knew about our health was wrong, silver was a primary component of the medicine cabinet since way back before the ancient Greeks. If you had access to it, you lived a longer, healthier life. Being born with a silver spoon in your mouth turns out was a good thing. At Third Rock Essentials, our signature chelated silver oxide formula is our key ingredient because we know it's simply the world's best weapon in the fight against infectious bacteria. Third Rock, personal care products you can trust.
I think our legislators have, <clears throat> um, are doing a really great job um, with hearing from people and their needs. Uh, we've evolved huge um, in the last, I don't know, two years with um, legislation, the way that's changing with Act 146, free entry, things like that. Um, in our, I, I would like to, you know, applaud them and uh, tell them I appreciate them. They come in all the time as um, a graduate, as speaker, they would speak at our graduations, things like that. But they're really getting involved to listen to what people have to say, to know what needs to be passed. Um, very, very proactive. So I think if they keep, uh, in my opinion, they just keep pushing in the same direction that they're going. The buy-in is really good for a lot of our legislators, and um, I'm proud to be a part of that in Arkansas for sure here in the South. Oh, absolutely. Buy-in is really, really critical because after all, they are creating the, you know, they're creating the budgets for everything. They're creating the laws. So absolutely. Uh, why is it important for the entire state of Arkansas to participate in the Day of Empathy from your perspective? This is really important because this is what Shine Your Light and WYTV7 is doing is trying to do this series leading up to the Day of Empathy so we can have more participation. Yes. Well, it's kind of black and white. Eight out of ten um, offenders that are incarcerated are coming home, and they're going to be um, community neighbors to all of the state of Arkansas. And so do we want them to come out with nothing, or do we want them to come out with some uh, cognitive behavior, you know, some like-minded things? But when they get here, uh, not even as, as Christians, just in empathy and humanity, how do we want to address them and make them feel when they come out? Um, I don't think that – they're looking for a hand up. I think they're, you know, or a hand out. They're looking for a hand up, but they're going to be um, neighbors, community neighbors. You know, we want good neighbors in Arkansas. Less crimes mean less victims. So I think I'm um, just engaging these people, having empathy for them and, you know, asking if they need anything, things like that, but not to be scared to just know that they're human too, because they've been incarcerated doesn't mean that they're any less than human. Absolutely. Um, did you say eight out of 10 will be uh, over what time period or do we know? Um, just over a year, eight out of 10. Uh, if you look at our, popu our total population and how many we're releasing every year, eight out of 10 will be released. You know, they, their sentences are shorter than, you know, life sentences, things like that, but they'll be released into Arkansas communities. And I think it's very, it's a, it's a, it would be a very powerful thing for the whole state to understand what the Day of Empathy is and why we're doing it. Absolutely. I had no idea that many uh, would be released. And that, that makes me happy. But I want, I want uh, them to be prepared as well as the communities to be prepared. Because, I mean, uh, once they've been through what they've been through, they can certainly be very productive members of society, you know. And uh, I really look forward to how they're going to mentor the young people to keep to lower mass incarceration, which is exactly what we have right now. And uh, I think if they mentored the young, the young, maybe this, maybe we could break the cycle. Maybe. Maybe so. Uh, we hope, pray so. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> we want to give them the tools that they need to be successful. But I, I think the big thing is that they have to have that aha moment. Like, aha, I don't want to come to prison anymore. And so it's just, Talk, you know, um, identifying who those individuals are and getting them the help. So when they are out, they will be successful. Yeah. Well, here uh, here in Arkansas, we're having a, a great number of uh, of uh, things. Uh, young young kids, not not just um, African American, but young kids breaking into cars and then going across town and selling the stuff. And I mean that's. That's just kind of like a breakdown to me of our society and what and how we how we're handling our young. And that's what I hope when when they when eight out of 10 get out of prison, hopefully they can mentor this and stop and stop that cycle and get them in going in a different direction. So, I mean, I, you're just reading more and more about that here in Arkansas. And uh, it's kind of sad. I have a friend in Atlanta. He said it's worse in Atlanta because Atlanta has more shopping areas larger shopping areas and of course uh, Little Rock does but it's really bad uh, over in Atlanta too so yes ma'am I have a funny feeling it's bad everywhere like that so I think think with having eight out of ten release that if they if we teach them right and we train them up and we get them just like you say if we give them a hand up they can probably help with a lot of those uh, societal problems so uh, what information uh, will people obtain attending the day of empathy Miss Nicole 
Um, I think a new perception um, with people um, that will be a part of the day of empathy that have been incarcerated before, have been in trouble before. Uh, they are law abiding. They have changed. They've paid their debt to society. And I think it's a very, very important. Sometimes the media focuses on the negative and the bad things that are happening in the world. But I think with the day of empathy, the people that will, will be a part of that, they are successful law abiding citizens that have changed their lives. You know, um, they're not going back to prison, the majority of them, you know, unless, it, you know, something was to happen. I just think it's a very important for the community to see that, that there are a, a million success stories out there. And I think we don't need to focus so much on the bad and the negative. We need to focus more on the positive and, and um, move, you know, evolve from that. You know, whatever worked, we need to evolve from that. Well, I really believe because the uh, bright and um, and competent uh, people like you that are in the programs that are creating things is help is help change some even probably from five years ago where where there was repeat offenses. I think now because they're trained before they go out that there's probably less and less repeat offenses, which is fantastic because I, and I agree with you, we need to talk about the success stories. Uh, that's what I do a lot on this, uh, on this radio show. As I interview people, I interview a lot of people, uh, a lot of formerly incarcerated and, uh, and let them tell their stories. And that's just part of a little bit about what, how I can do that. And, uh, it's just, um, you know, I just think it's so important and I really do believe that it has stopped, uh, it's lowered the, the uh, repeat offenses. Do you have any statistics on that or anything? We have some preliminary numbers right now that we can't release because we're, oh. just, we're just now getting into our fourth year. When we can release them, I think the numbers are going to be uh, astounding. Like, I'm very, very excited about the numbers. I just need to verify, you know, <laughs> confirm they're correct. But I think it's going to be really good. One thing that you talked about, um, you know, the stories and the success stories, something came to my mind when you were speaking we have a cohort to um, to our program where we have like the University of Arkansas um, does letter writing to children, letter writing to children, excuse me. Not only does it help with the grammar and speaking and, you know, boost their motivation, they're learning how to speak to their children again. But I had a lady one night in a cooking matters class. That's where we teach them how to cook on a budget healthy. And I had a young lady uh, that she started crying and she said it was very, very sad that she had to learn how to cook in prison. Like nobody had ever really showed her anything. And I think those are the things that the community needs to know. Some of these individuals had no support, no, no function, no, no stability, anything in life, but they're learning it in prison. So it's very, very sad to me, but it's very, very humbling that we can teach them this. And I think that those are the big things that people need to focus on. The community is like, they, they were never taught how to live right. So, um, or, or what was, what was normal? You know, they really didn't have a concept of what normal was. They never had a normal childhood, normal adult life, anything. So I just want to add that. I think that's the big thing is that we structure. structure yeah. and, 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 you know, you know, also, yeah, you know, also, um, they, they, uh, a lot of them have been in prison for so long, you know, like 25 years, 28 years, 46 years. I mean, a lot has happened. I mean, we can bear I'm old, so we can barely keep up with well, all the changes that we have now, much less we have access to it. Yes. But what in the world if you didn't have access to it? How, how do you even learn how to use a smartphone or how do you even learn how to use a computer? And you can't survive without them, especially, right. you know, you just can't. So right. I think it's a, the learning curve is, is – um, it could be very frustrating uh, to a lot of people because they don't have access to the internet much or the telephones much and all that. And the world moves so fast now that, uh, you know, it could just, it could overwhelm you really, really fast. So. Absolutely. And we've implemented that computers and tablets that kind of look, work like smartphones and you're right. They'll look at it and they'll be like, Oh my gosh, what is <laughs> uh, you're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, I've been retired uh, from the corporate world for 20, for 15 years now. And uh, if I didn't keep my skills up, where would I be? I couldn't do any of my volunteer work that I love to do and help people because that's all I did for 25 years was work at a credit union and help people. So I couldn't imagine not being able to help people in some way. And I couldn't do that if I didn't keep my skills up. But, uh, you know, not everybody, not everybody wants to do that when they retire. They just want to stop. And I'm like, oh, no, not me. I'm a busybody. <laughs> I'm a busybody. I got to keep busy, but uh, it's just to help people. That's all. 
And uh, now I've now I've gone in the past uh, three years into uh, into dealing with uh, publishing and the, and the incarcerating and things like that. And I absolutely love it because a lot of uh, people that are incarcerated, they take notes, they write journals. Oh, yeah. You can actually take those journals and create a book from it that tells their whole story. And, uh, you know, so it's real exciting. So uh, do you have any parting words for, for us? We're almost through. Uh, I just wanted you to have some freedom to speak on whatever you wanted to speak on here at the end. Okay. Um, well, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm truly honored that she chose me to um, do this interview. And I'm glad that um, our, I'm glad the Think Legacy program and other programs that we're implementing in the side of the Department of Corrections are being noticed because they are so important. Um, and I guess a, a parting words, if there are any volunteers or mentors that want to come into um, the system and help us because it takes a village to make this successful, please reach out to me. Um, that's, that's our biggest thing is we need mentors and volunteers. Um, and really, uh, to the community, they are, you know, these people are coming out into your community and they, they really just need, um, to be functional and gainfully employed. And, uh, there are good people in prison that just need some structure and some assistance when they're, when they're released. That's right. Well, you know what we'll do? Uh, we'll put some uh, verbiage up here and you can give us your contact, how you want them to contact you. We'll put that up there and um, be sure we give what, what you want us to give so people will be able to reach you because we have a lot, we've had, we have a lot of viewers on this series that we're doing. So I'm, I'm praying that it'll just bring more people out on, on uh, March 25th, the day of empathy. Well, thank you so much for being with us. I appreciate you uh, spending a little time with me and, um, We'll we'll talk to you later. I thank you, darling. Thank you. Bye bye.